Okay. So as we start on suppression, there's three things you should remember. One is you take suppression anytime you are shot at. Doesn't matter whether you are hit or not. Anytime you are shot at, you take one point of suppression from every shot. So I will repeat. Anytime you are shot at, you take one point of suppression from every shot. So if somebody fires a double shot at you, even if both shots miss, you take two points of suppression. So that's the first thing to remember. Each time a shot is made against a model with the first three eyes of the weapon, and again, that's that whole range interval, which is kind of nonsense, because apparently after the fourth range interval, uh, when you get to the fourth range, it doesn't cause suppression. But to give you an example, one of the lowest range weapons is a pistol at eight inches. The first three RIs of a pistol is 24 inches. So meaning if somebody is firing a pistol at you at you know, 26 inches, well, you wouldn't take suppression. Okay, well, we agree with that. But if you look at most of the table ranges, that's never going to come into play. You probably wouldn't even have line of sight on somebody with a pistol that's 26 inches across the table. And that's the lowest weapon, right? You get to an M16, which has 16 inches. Well, the first three I is going to put that weapon out to about 42 inches, which is almost four feet. So nobody, most people aren't even playing on tables with those ranges. So pretty much you're always going to take one suppression point whether you are hit by the shot or not. Okay. And then it says some weapons inflict more suppression per shot. These are in the weapons rule. So that might be like HE weapons or weapons that deliver HE. Okay. Uh, suppression is applied as one point per shot per model engaged. So weapons with more than one shot allowed inflict a lot of suppression. In addition, all models in the area of a blast marker are affected by suppression. So that's kind of your first thing to remember about suppression. If I shoot at you, you take suppression. So remember, if you're playing somebody and you're playing the insurgents, make sure that person is taking their suppression. The second thing you have to remember about suppression is... Depending on your profile, there is a limit to how many suppression you can take. So for elite, the maximum amount is up to two points each. Professionals, it's up to three points each. And then that's pretty much it. So if you're an elite or a professional, they do limit how much suppression you can take, no matter how many times someone shoots at you. Other people could technically have six or seven suppression on them, where they're basically suppressed out of action. The third thing to remember about the suppression is once you take suppression, it will affect your movement, your shooting, your close combat, and your command characteristics. So that means if you look at your profile, your command is going to be affected by suppression, your agility, which involves movement, is going to be suppressed, supp uh, affected by suppression. Your shooting is going to be affected by suppression. The only thing that isn't going to be affected is your defense and your ME, which I think is morale. Although I don't know if it is morale or not, because I don't remember any morale coming into play in this game. Oh, that's close combat. So your close combat will also be affected by suppression. So basically, suppression is going to affect all of your stats except for your defense and your points value, obviously. The, the thing to remember with that, 3B, is it is cumulative. So if you have 3 suppression, it is a minus 3. It'll be a minus 3 to your movement, minus 3 to your shooting, minus 3 to your ME or close combat, and minus 3 to your command characteristics. And the funny thing is, this is one paragraph on suppression. It's very succinct. It's very easy to understand. And it is the most overlooked, most gotten wrong part of the rules that I have seen in playthroughs. People blow by the suppression. People play games and take shots and then remember later, oh yeah, I should have a point of suppression. Let me put it. Whoa. 
If you were supposed to have a point of suppression, then we need to re-roll all those shots you just did. You can't take your shots and move and fire and do all this stuff, finish a, a close combat, and say, oh, you know what? I should have got uh, some suppression from when them two guys fired at me. Let me throw that on real quick. No. You know, that's boat action. You know, where you throw on suppression and you don't have to worry about it again until next turn. That's not how it works in, in uh, Spectre operations. Once you take suppression, it starts affecting you immediately. Which would be the fourth thing to remember. Suppression affects you immediately. It doesn't wait to the next turn to affect you. It affects you then. And the reason that is significant is every turn after the command phase... Every model loses one point of suppression. And that is another thing I see overlooked a lot. Is a lot of these jihadis or insurgent models will get laden with a bunch of suppression. And the player forgets to take off one every turn after the command phase from everyone that has suppression. There's no command roll needed. There's no thing that has to be passed. It's just after the command actions are done you take off one point of suppression. It says here, the number removed can be increased by rally. Oh wait, each model loses one suppression point at the beginning of each command phase, right there. Each model. And that's something else you will see get overlooked often by the insurgent players. The elite guys can't wait to throw their suppression off. And so that's what I that's that's what I'm just going to tell you about resolving the suppression. We see close combat. Uh, so I don't have much to say on that. I haven't done too many close combats. Vehicles. I'm just getting into the vehicle rules, so I can't tell you much about vehicles yet. Uh, Although I did see one set of rules which I, I saw a character do wrong. So if a, if a person is in a vehicle, right, and I saw them do this the whole game, and I just was driving me crazy. I'm just sitting there with my hand, hand going through my hair, just pulling my hair in little stretches like, ah, oh, because he did it three times and it allowed, basically allowed the, the, uh, the, uh, elite player to win because the, the insurgent had to get his vehicle off the map and so every time the guy put a guy in the vehicle the elite player would say oh i'm gonna target the driver pap pap ah oh, your driver's dead and it's oh okay well next turn we'll 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 have to replace the driver nope you can't do that you can't do that if a person is in a vehicle you must target the vehicle you cannot target quote the driver and the reason you can't do that is because one of the effects of shooting at a vehicle, if you penetrate it, is the driver is hit. Okay, the driver is hit. Otherwise, you are targeting the vehicle. If somebody's on the back of the vehicle and the bed of the vehicle, that's fine. But if they're inside the vehicle, you have to target the vehicle. You cannot target the driver and simply say, oh, I killed, I'm aiming at the driver, I hit, he's dead. Right? Now, I mean, practically that makes a lot of sense. But for game purposes, there's obviously a reason they don't want to let you do that. It's because it makes vehicles kind of, <laughs> kind of redundant and obsolete in the game. If all you're going to do is shoot the drivers every time they jump in there. So they require you to target the vehicle. So, and I, I'm trying to see here because, let, all right, here we go. Let's just say crews. Vehicles are assumed to be crewed by trained level models are included in the points cost for the vehicle. That's something else you probably didn't know. So, all of those games where you see somebody saying, I target the driver and, you know, I've got to move another man and put him in there. You don't have to have anybody in there. Once you purchase a vehicle for a scenario, it's already crewed. And the only way the driver is going to be hit is if you score a driver hit. Right? Then you can put something in there with, well, I'm going to get in and replace the driver. So, remember that. 
You know, if, if you get a vehicle in your game, a truck or whatever that you purchase, the drive, the cost of the driver is already included, which I didn't even do that correct in my scenario. I just played. I actually put my guys in there. I didn't know I got drivers with it. And I think, I wonder, do you get a passenger? It says it's crewed by train level models and are included. In the, so you get a driver and a passenger. As far as I can see, train level models with an S. Uh... So anyway, that's one of the things you want to pay attention to, to however you play your vehicles. Uh, when you purchase them, you get a crew free, okay? And you cannot target the crew in them directly. You're shooting at the vehicle, right? Now it says here, results of crew being killed. If crew are killed as a result of combat or collisions, the following should be applied. Driver is killed. The driver is killed. The vehicle may no longer move. Blah, blah, blah. A surviving model may take control of the vehicle the following turn. Gunner is killed. If the gunner is killed, vehicle may no longer make range to attack. The surviving model may... So, you know, obviously you can replace your crew. Uh, now, running somebody over with the vehicle. If you try to run somebody over called ramming personnel, they automatically get an agility ch test to move out of the way. Okay, so you you can't automatically just run people over like you just smash through, you know, rows of people. I don't know if I've seen that or not, but you they do get an agility test to get out of the way. So we get through vehicles and vehicle special rules. We're getting into advanced rules with civilians, human terrain, covert rules, night shooting at night. Now, another mistake that I've seen people use with the night ruse is this. So when you shoot at night, almost all of your stats and things are, are very badly uh, affected. But the one I see people do a lot is, it says ranged attacks at night. Ranged attacks are severely hampered by night fighting and follow the rules below. So your night range, if, you're, if somebody's 12 inches away, you have a minus one modifier. If they're 24 more inches away, you automatically miss. Okay. So, what a lot of times I have seen people play with the night ruse is, well, I'm more than 24 inches away, so you can't hit me because it's night. You can't see me or shoot at me because it's night. That's not what the rules say. And remember, the rules do not say they cannot see you. The rules say they automatically miss. They can still shoot at you. They can still put suppression on you. There's nowhere in there that says they cannot see you at night. Right? So if you have night vision equipment, it removes the penalties, right, as far as the range and the penalties things go. But it does not mean you cannot be shot at at night more than 24 inches away. I seen a game where they were measuring it because it was night and said, oh, he's he's 26 inches. Oh, sorry, you can't shoot at me. You can't see me. That's not what the rules say. They don't say I can't see you. They don't say I can't shoot at you. It says I will automatically miss. Right? And it doesn't say you need light to shoot at somebody at night. Human eyes can see in the dark. You don't need lights to see at somebody at night. Only thing a light do, does is it creates a light pool and it says at night can be declared light pools. Any activity can, is as if the play is conducted during the day. These can be marked by chalk, ribbon, or whatever. A, a model wearing night vision optics ignores the night fighting rules and may act normally. Okay. Now, what I think a lot of people get confused with the rules is what's called detection and alertness. So if you're trying to detect or alert somebody at night, then yes, you, you might not be able to see them beyond a certain range where you can't detect them. But you got to remember with detection and alertness, once the shooting stops, the de starts, the detection and alertness rules are over with. So once a shot is fired, unless it's a silencer or a silent kill, you don't have to do anything else anymore with no detection or alertness. I've seen guys play detection or alertness for four rounds of the game. 
Everybody's shooting, popping each other off. Machine guns. They're throwing grenades in the buildings. And then they're talking about, oh, you didn't detect me. I'm too far away. It's dark. You didn't detect me. No, dude, you just threw a grenade. Everybody has detected you and is alert. Right? And we can go there if you guys want to look at that. Because I guess that's another mistake that maybe I should point out is the detection and alert rules are only applicable until there's firing that starts out. Okay? So let's go on because that was I think that was just the alertness. Let's go to detection. And again, like I said, the second edition I know has changed suppression a lot. And if anything, I think it's made it more complicated because now you go from just being suppressed to a suppression number one, suppression number two, and all of these different types of things, uh, which I think makes it more complicated. All right, so let's get to movement, detection, and alertness. Okay. And so and I'm not going to even get into all of this detection day range, detection night range, and so forth. So... We are going to get to on alert models, uh, detection in darkness, hearing, becoming alerted. Let's do here, becoming alerted. This is what we need. This is all you need to read on here is becoming alerted. An unsuppressed gunshot within 36 inches of an unalert model causes them to be alerted. A low-level aircraft overflight at a battlefield causes all models to be alerted. Okay. Uh, and I'm assuming as far as grenades go that that would cause all models to be alert also. There is also raising the alarm. Any model killed within 4 inches of another or 12 inches from a dog will cause the alarm to be raised at the end of the combat phase, regardless if they are in line of sight or not due to noise. Meaning if you drop a guy inside the house and he's there's another model within 4 inches or a dog within 12 inches, they those models become alert and they can then raise the alarm. Okay, a model killed in friendly line of sight and within 12 inches will cause the alarm to be raised. A model is able to hear any moving unit within 4 inches and therefore detect them, becoming alerted at the start of the following turn. Now, a model that becomes alerted can immediately, quote, raise the alarm. As a result, the squad becomes alert at the beginning of the following turn. The squad is not cohesive, the alertness only passes to those the alerted model is cohesive with. So if you are moving up on a squad and you kill one of the models, the alert is going to be raised. And once models become alert, they do not have to roll about detecting you. Okay? Because they are now alert. And that's what you have to under understand is that all of this stuff with detection and stuff has to do with being detected before models have become alert. An unsuppressed gunshot will alert models within 36 inches of it. So that means the whole three feet of the table around every gunshot causes everyone around there to become alert. So what happens is if you are trying to detect somebody and you're not alert at night, the line of sight is 0 to 12 inches. Which means, if you, if, unless you're within 12 inches, you can be automatically detected. If you are 12 to 24 inches, uh, use the 60 to 72 inch detection range. Models 24 plus cannot be detected at night. So that's what I was talking about. People will measure and say, well, it's at night, I'm more than 24 inches, you can't shoot at me. Well, that doesn't say they can't shoot at you, it says you can't be detected if you haven't already shot or done something to cause yourself to be detected or to cause them to become alert. Once they become alert, though, you can be detected. And so I'm just going to double check that. And it says a model that becomes alerted can immediately raise the alarm. So basically, once the alarm is raised, everybody becomes alert and can then begin detecting people with the normal, you know, nighttime rules. 
So, you know, the whole detection ruse is basically trying to sneak up on models that are unalert, right? And they don't know you're coming. They don't know you're out there. Once you shot and models know you're out there, they can shoot at you. So then we go to combat. We have throwing grenades, direct fire combat, sequence of fire, uh, line of sight, targeting roles. Most of this we've talked about. Cover. One thing I like about these rules is they take care of cover very quickly. They don't get real bogged down. They basically say just about anything should be a minus one. If it's just an elbow or a shoulder sticking out, then you give them a minus two. Uh, we already looked at lethality and casualties. We've already looked at suppression. So let's go back to where we were at. We were at vehicles. So let's see. Did we finish up with vehicle, vehicle collisions, vehicles and equipment, vehicle special rules, advanced rules. So we have covert rules. Uh, so this is if you have models in civilian dress and stuff. I might try to play that in the game. That looks fun. The night rules. We've kind of talked about them. Hidden troops. So I'm not familiar with them a lot. A lot. Sniper stalk. So this is where your snipers can move. Ghillie suits and things. So... I haven't really looked at those. Scenario specific rules and solo play. There's not much in there. Ammo and loadouts. So the thing I'm going to say about ammo and loadouts is first of all, I don't think nobody uses the ammo rules. That's kind of cumbersome. I mean, maybe if you're playing one guy and he's being tracked, you might want to use your ammo and loadout rules. But uh, for average games, nobody uses that. That's just too cumbersome. Uh, but so these are characteristics of your weapons. Rapid fire, grenade launchers, armor piercing. Most of this is self-explanatory. Thrown weapons, heavy weapons, profiles. So this is what I want to point out. All of these weapon profiles have a point value for these weapons. So let's say you have an elite soldier, which I think we said was 30 points. Let's say you give... You want to give that elite soldier, let me see if I can find me, just a piece of scrap paper. We're going to give him a uh, unarmed combat training, which is one point. We're going to give him a combat knife, which is one point. We're going to give him a Glock pistol, which is two points. We're going to give him a... Uh, M4 which is 8 points ok so then we keep going everybody loves to bring grenades right so let's look at grenades those are grenade launchers alright so we're going to give him a frag grenade that's 5 points let's say 2 frag grenades another 5 points we're going to give him a smoke grenade that's 5 points Okay, let's keep going. We are now going to equip him with... Uh, so let's go to the equipment. Because we will do weapons and equipment at the same time. And I'm just trying to show you an example. So, let's say we want to equip him with a... Uh, I want to find, where is the uh, the vest at, the body armor? All right, body armor, regular body armor. That's 10 points. We want to give him a laser sight. It's three points. A red dot, three points. A scope, five points. Okay. Now we want to give him a battlefield trauma kit. And that reminds me, I might go back over that because I don't think we talked about the uh, med kits and things. But so we'll give each guy their own battlefield trauma kit. That's five points. Let's say he's our commander. We're giving him long range comms. 
That's 15 points. And anything else? Off-table assets. All right, no. So let's just limit this to the man. So remember, your, your, your leader is 30 points. Now let's add up all of his gear that we just gave him. We just loaded this guy up with a full tactical loadout. So we have 1, 2, plus 2 is 4. We have 8 is 12, plus another 10 is 22, plus 5 is 27, plus 10 is 37, plus 3 is 40, plus 8 is 48, plus 5 is 53, plus 15 is 68. So all of that equipment plus his normal points of 30 is 98 point value. So if you are paying, playing a 500 point game, for example, and you give all of your guys this equipment, right? You are going to, for, if you bring five guys, that is all 500 of your points. You don't have any call-ins to bring in with that or anything else. That's just your loadout, right? Your knife, your comms, your body armor, your weapon, your grenades, your laser sights, your laser dots, your scopes, all of that is going to run you about 100 points per special operator. If you want to do stuff like have a helicopter call in, that's 45 points. If you want to have, let's just say, where's where's a drone strike coming in? You know, I want to, I want to call in a drone hit. I know a lot of people like to use the whole, the whole, I'm bringing in a drone, <laughs> which I don't I don't know. Let me see if they have a separate uh, thing. Unguided arm bomb, laser guided bomb, ice tar UAV. So I don't, I don't know. I don't see it here. But let's just call it a. Uh, let's just call it a. Uh, where's an airstrike at? Off table assets. Specialist gear. Close air support cannon is a hundred points by itself so if you were trying to call in a warthog that would be a hundred points of your allocation for your team now remember if you're bringing five guys and you've got all of them kitted out that's 500 points right there so to call in a, a warthog strike you'd need a hundred points to call in any kind of helicopter attack you're looking at another 50 to 75 points you know, laser guided bombs and 125 points. That would be, I guess, your drone. So remember, if you're playing against an elite guy and he says, oh, my guy's got comms, he can call in a strike. Yeah, but did he pay the points for it? You can do a lot of things, but did you pay the points? Because if you're going to give your guy a, a an airstrike, you know, from a, a helicopter or from a, a warthog, that gives me an extra 100 points to spend. So maybe if I'm the uh, if I'm the jihadi payer and I say, "Well, holy crap, I got a I got an extra 100 points to spend." I might as well bring me a tank. You know, let's see if I have enough enough rules to bring in, bring in a tank. Uh main armament tank gun. 45 points with a 90 millimeter gun on a tank so that's that's what you pay for the gun itself let's see what the tank costs uh where's where's this at let's let's see i mean because you want to play balanced games right who wants to get run over by elites game after game after game all right so attract armored fighting vehicle that's a bradley no attract tank is only 70 points so you can bring an attract tank for 70 points and it already comes with turret, tank gun, coaxial, MMG, roof mounted MMG, night vision lights, night vision sights, MBSGD. All of that is all the stuff that comes with a track mounted tank. If you want to up gun it, you know, like a 90 millimeter gun and all that stuff, then you can pay even more points to up gun the turret and stuff, the armament on it. You know, you could bring a buttload of IEDs for an extra 100 points. 
So the point I'm trying to make is, you know, if you are going to play these so-called elite teams running around killing 40, 50 jihadis every mission without taking any casualties, then you should at least make sure if you are on the insurgent site, you are getting your equivalent points worth for everything they're bringing and calling in. And again, somebody can say, well, yeah, we're just playing a fun scenario. Yeah, that might be a fun for you if you're the one, you know, blowing everything up. If you're the one rolling over the other guy who's just sitting there getting his dues blown off the map. But the whole purpose that they mention in the ruse is quote unquote realism. They say over and over again, these rules are supposed to reflect realism. So the last thing we're going to look at, and I'm going to finish this up, is we're going to go to the uh, medical equipment. All right, because there's one, there's kind of a few discrepancies, I think, with the way people view the equipment. So you only have three types of medical equipment in the game. You have med kits, battle trauma kits, and stimulant packs and they're all play a different role and you have to pay for each one separately right there's not one kit that does what the other one does so a med kit a model with a personal med kit is given a minus one modifier on any roles on the casualty table so the first scenario I played I kitted my guys out with med kits just to see how they worked and so what that meant is if I roll on the casualty table which means you don't take a lethality, right? The shot is not lethal, but you do get hit. So if I was rolling on the casualty table, and let's just say I rolled a four, which is a pretty serious casualty, incapacitating serious wound, bleed out in four turns, cannot even move. Well, if I have a personal med kit, it becomes a three. So now I'm bleed out in five turns. I still cannot move, uh, but I can fire my sidearm for three turns. So a med kit is not going to help you that much, just to be honest with you. And even if you, you take a light wound, the med kit is not going to stop you from taking that wound. You still would have to take a light wound, right? It just minuses one on these other items, right? But it's always going to be, be a one. If you're rolling on the casualty table because you are a casualty but that's all a med kit does it doesn't stop the bleed out it doesn't do anything but minus one on your casualty roll now we go to the battlefield trauma kit everybody's favorite on on the scenarios I've watched everybody's got a, a but pockets full of battlefield trauma kits a model equipped with a battlefield trauma kit may attempt to stop another model from bleeding out so you can't use your battlefield trauma kit on yourself. That's the first thing to realize. When the equipped model moves into contact with the casualty, it may attempt to treat the casualty instead of fighting in the combat phase. So you can treat them in the combat phase. Not whenever you want. It says in the combat phase. So if you move into contact with them in the movement phase, you can't treat them and then both of you get up and come blasting in the combat phase. You have to wait till the combat phase. Right? Which is another thing I don't see a lot of people paying attention to. It is you can treat them in the combat phase. It's not I can treat you in the movement phase. Now you can shoot but I can't shoot in the combat phase. No, it's you have to wait till the combat phase to treat them. Now keep going. The player rolls a d6 on a score of 4 plus. The model is successfully treated and the bleed out is permanently halted. So that will stop a bleed out permanently. Remember I said if you apply pressure, it stops a bleed out temporarily. It suspends it. It pauses it. Other models in contact with the casualty equipped with a battlefield trauma kit and not making an attack in the combat phase may aid the attempt by giving a plus one modifier to the dice roll. If the roll fails, then the attending model may attempt to treat the casualty again in the next turn. So that is the other thing to remember about your battlefield trauma kits. They're not extinguished. So it's not like if you use your battlefield trauma kit and it doesn't work, you have to go and ask another guy for his battlefield trauma kit. 
No, you can attempt to treat them again in the next turn. Now, it doesn't say if it's successful, whether the kit is extinguished or not, but from the way I read it, it, it it's not. It's, it's a kit. It's a box. So basically, uh, as long as you have a battlefield trauma kit, you can move into contact and treat people. It's sort of like being a medic. But that is another thing I see people play wrong. They never indicate who has the battlefield trauma kit in the game. Instead, they'll have five guys, somebody will get hit, and they say, oh, well, I, I bought a battlefield trauma kit. I'm going to move this guy next to him and treat him. Whoa. Which one of your guys is carrying the battlefield trauma kit? So remember, you want to ask them which one is carrying, which one of you has the battlefield trauma kit. So in a scenario I played, I had kind of gave everybody five battlefield trauma kits because I thought they were re mean they were one time use. You use it and throw it away. That's not how it works. You you don't need five. You maybe need one or two, just long as you know who's carrying it. Okay. The final thing is. A stimulant pack in conjunction with a battlefield trauma kit will add plus one modifier to treatment roles. Right? Any model may be treated, friendly, enemy, or neutral. That's another thing to remember. It doesn't have to be your own model. If you're in a scenario and you need to bring in a you know bring in a high value target and the target is wounded and bleeding out, you can get treat them with a battlefield trauma kit to make sure they don't die and save your mission. Stimulant packs. A model equipped with stimulants cannot heal a casualty. So remember that. It does not stop bleed out. It does not remove, quote, the word casualty. None of these remove casualties. Right? None of these remove a casualty. Right? The only thing the Battlefield Trauma Kit does is stop the bleed out. However, it can provide the casualty with a massive dose of narcotics and stimulants and painkillers, right? So that's kind of like morphine that they used to give them in Vietnam and stuff. When the model that is equipped, again, you got to be equipped with it, moves into contact with the casualty, it may attempt to treat the casualty in what phase? The combat phase. So again, it's not as soon as you move into contact with them. You have to wait to the combat phase. Player rolls a dice on the 4 plus, the model is successfully treated and may now return to the battle with no penalty modifiers. So that is the only way to get rid of your stats being half. The battlefield trauma kit doesn't do it. The med kit doesn't do it. You have to have the stimulant kit so that your, your model, you have no longer any modifiers on on your model if you have taken a casualty it does not mean if you get hit with a casualty again you don't die it remember this is just a boost of adrenaline that's offsetting the effect of the casualty or the wound you already have it says bleed out of the model is giving plus one turns so if you just use a stimulant pack without the battlefield trauma kit it increases the bleed out so if you had two turns before you bleed out it will reset it to three turns it says, but it continues unless treated with a battlefield trauma kit. When it reaches zero, the model instantly becomes a fatality. A stimulant pack used in conjunction with a battlefield trauma kit adds a plus one modifier to the treatment role. So they basically, uh, they basically, uh, it's a word I'm looking for. They basically kind of synchronize with each other, right? So... There's some uh, synergy is the word I'm looking for. If you are treating somebody with a stimulant pack and a battlefield trauma kit, you're going to get a plus one on your battlefield trauma kit roll, and you're also going to get a plus one on your stimulant pack roll. Now, it doesn't say if multiple people with stimulant packs, they can apply an additional plus one. That's only with the battlefield trauma kits. But that's pretty much it, guys. Those are the most common mistakes people have made with the original Spectre Operation rules. I think it's a good system. You know, there's a few things in there that are kind of ambiguous. Or, uh, or there's a few things in there that are just kind of ambiguous or hard to implement. You know, like that whole range interval thing. 
But for the most part, it is a it is actually a good system. I think it plays pretty quick. Uh, I think it's fairly realistic if you play it correctly and accurately. And that's why I did this video. Take care. Let me know what you think. Leave your comments below. God bless.